Welcome to Cube Conversations. Cube Conversations is a new series by SiliconANGLE Wikibon where we bring people into our studios. We're live here from Marlboro, Massachusetts. Greg Shearer is here. He's the Vice President of Server and Storage Strategy at Broadcom. And we're going to talk about trends in storage and networking. Greg, welcome back to the Cube. Thank you very much. It's, it's great to be here. Yeah, so we see you at all the shows. You know, we, we travel around. Uh, we go to the events and it's good, good to have you here. Um, Tell us what's new in, uh, in Broadcom's world. Boy, things never stay uh, the same for very long. We have a lot of new things going on, uh, both on the switching infrastructure side. We've uh, officially released our Trident 2, our highest port count switch. Uh, very exciting, used in an awful lot of the switch infrastructure that's out there these days. <clears throat> We've also done things on the very opposite end, too, in that we have, uh, we just announced a few weeks ago uh, 5725 uh, integrated BMC 1 gig and BMC controller, which, you know, you think, boy, it's kind of an odd thing for Broadcom to, to get into is kind of the, the uh, you know, baseboard management controller. Um, but this really plays into, I think, a lot of the topics that we want to talk to today, and it's really about the cloud. So we kept uh, being approached by a lot of the cloud vendors, uh, infrastructure folks saying, you know, we really want a very lightweight management controller. You guys have kind of the industry leading one gig controller, uh, a lot of the 10 gig controllers as well. What can we do to uh, simplify and have an open management controller, uh, you know, for kind of the, I'll call it the lower end or the, the hyperscale kind of environment, not locked into any given, you know, vendor using open standards, DMTF based smash uh, kind of standards. So we have things on, on uh, the management controller side, uh, lots of, of 10 gig software enhancements that you know, we're, we're uh, constantly rolling out. And, uh, and really looking at, at a lot of the, the cloud applications that I think we'll talk about today too. Yeah, definitely. So uh, if you look at the, the trends in the last 15, 20 years, you've seen function sort of move out of the host server into the, the SAN and you're seeing the pendulum swing back and a lot of things driving that. There's there's flash, there's there's convergence, you talked about cloud. So what are you seeing in terms of the, the bigger picture storage trends, and then we'll get in deep. Boy, a, a tremendous amount of movement in, in storage. And that, you know, if we look at the cloud, the cloud is converged. You know, we, we hear about in the, the classic enterprise, and an awful lot of the time we hear, you know, people talk about storage convergence. Well, the cloud, I'd like to, to say the cloud was really born uh, converged. Um, you know, people don't have separate storage appliances that they put in uh, that are storage only. These are really servers with a global file system or an object-based file system. And uh, that's how people do storage in the hyperscale or cloud type environments. And so, you know, we see that trend growing. You know, the, the amount of storage is certainly growing at a huge rate within these hyperscale or public cloud type environments. And, and so we see some of those same trends moving over away from just, uh, say, the hyperscale or, or uh, you know, large public cloud vendors into even private cloud and some of the enterprise as well. Stu, you've written a lot about that, that, that factor right there, the sort of hyperscale bleeding into the enterprise. What yeah, so, so, so Greg, it's interesting. We talk about you know, the, the components breaking down. If you look at what you know, Facebook uh, is doing with open compute, we said, can we just completely disaggregate the pieces? Uh, you know, I remember years ago when Facebook's you know, photo repository was growing. <laughs> they used to use traditional filers from you know, a big name vendor, and it reached a point they were growing too fast, and, and, the, and the cost just wasn't there that they had to change the architecture. Um, but you know, I think those of us watch, you know, it's not going to you know, break down to everybody buying their own chips and pieces together. There, there has to be uh, some balance there. And we heard from Amazon last week that you know, they don't think it should be some just giant pool. Uh, we say you know, Facebook built you know, five configurations and everything can run off that. Uh, we, we heard from Amazon, they actually hyper-specialize uh, what they're doing and have more and more configurations because when they scale each application, they want to configure that and, and, and have, uh, ha have those pieces in place. So, you know, how do you see that those trends playing out? Boy, it's so true. You know, Stu, we, we see more and more the, the whole notion of this uh, hyper-specialization. I mean, er earlier this year, we heard about Baidu coming out with kind of their storage server that uh, you know, it was really a, a multi-terabyte uh, kind of uh, enclosure and a 2U form factor, not really meant for speed, but meant for, you know, the, the term that we've kind of coined after the fact is more cold storage. We hear Facebook talking about uh, that as well. Amazon Glacier is another one, right? 
Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Facebook had talked about, oh, goodness, uh, they, they talked about just in terms of uploading pictures, this data is a little bit old now, but really only about a quarter old. Um, they, they do somewhere in the neighborhood of a petabyte of raw storage just in pictures a day. And then they store those in different image formats. And so by the time they store the different image formats and they index it, they're looking at about you know north of, of 10 petabytes a day in terms of their storage growth. And you think, my gosh, what do you, what do, you do? How do you keep up with that? And I think that's, uh, to your point, you can't have a traditional filer or a traditional storage array keep up with that. So you have to do some very specialized things in order to keep up with that kind of traffic. So you're seeing the spinning disk uh, bottleneck being addressed by, by Flash. Mm -hmm. The cold storage, you don't care so much about you know, latencies and, and, and the like. So is network, is the network becoming the bottleneck and, and, and how is the industry dealing with that? Well, that's a great point because you know, heretofore, uh, you know, a lot of one gig was used in the enterprise, and one gig networking was fine for, for messaging. But now that we're talking about richer and richer content, where this content is, you know, as we talked about, petabytes worth of, of uh, data, th there's no way you can keep up with that with one gig network. So much of, of the hyperscale environment has already moved to 10 gig right to the edge. Um, some of the public cloud infrastructure is, is rapidly chasing 40 gig. Uh, very, very fast uh, network uh, uh, speeds, and a lot of that's to, to basically globalize their storage pools. So rather than having one giant array that had, you know, petabytes worth of data behind that array, now you distribute those petabytes and you have the data fall wherever you can fit it, you know, in uh, specialized servers that have lots of storage attached to them. But in order to get at that data now, um, you end up having very fat pipes. Um, which really has a, a whole trickle down in terms of, of how you build your networks. You no longer have aggregation level switches that, you know, you have one gig at the edge and maybe 10 gig, you know, in your backbones. You have 10 gig all the way to the edge. So your backbones, you have a full cross-sectional bandwidth that's 10 gig everywhere and moving to 40 gig. Yeah. So, so, so I want to understand the premise on this whole notion mm -hmm. of data locality. Are you saying that increasingly customers will, will sort of put the data wherever it's most convenient and then you'll architect the network globally but you still got to have fat pipes to get to it because you've still got to move data or function or metadata to and from that location, is that right? Uh, that's absolutely it. One of the, the first premises of, of the big data environment was actually to move compute to where the data lived because the data was just so massive uh, but that was predicated on very small pipes so you know one gig kind of networking, inexpensive networks um, now what we're seeing is is that the data is so massive in some cases. Uh, you know, Google has talked about the amount of flat data that they capture on a daily basis being measured in petabytes in, in the North American market alone. So what ends up happening is, is you end up having to move that data around in order to make effective use of it. So the idea is, is your pipes get much fatter to where th the idea is to still try and move the compute to where the data is but many of the servers can't hold as much data as is uh, is needed to process so your network is really your universal transport to move that data around especially the metadata you know as you are capturing you know results from that uh, initial uh, data and storing it elsewhere you're using the network as your transport so if i can leave much of the data where it is act on the mes metadata and maybe maybe the metadata sitting in fast flash or even in memory mm -hmm. that just changes the whole way in which we look at the yeah, so, so, so Greg, I wonder if I could poke at that a bit, because sure. I, I can hear, uh, you know, Wikibon CTO uh, and co-founder David Fleur yelling in the back <laughs> of my head, um, even with fat pipes, you know, the laws of physics rule. And if I have a large amount of data, and some of it's here and some of it's there, transporting that data takes a long time. So does it all need to come together? So when I think about, you know, Amazon has Direct Connect, so mm -hmm. I want to have, you know, a fat pipe sitting right between, you know, my location, maybe it's at Equinix or something, going to Amazon. Do I want a colo where I can have my data in that I own it, but I have a cloud that basically I can put just a fat pipe over a wall, because if we're talking about miles between my data, even if I have a fat pipe, it's not going to get from here to there. No, it's, it's a great point in that, you know, it, it, one, of, one of my favorite stories about, you know, that in terms of fat pipe versus, you know, uh, overall bandwidth is, is that many of the, the huge uh, mega data centers, their fastest data transfer are things like FedEx, 
where they'll take you know discs that they'll go ahead and do local backup and they'll ship it from one site to the next because they get the best <laughs> bandwidth that way and you think how can that be but yet even you know 40 gigabit you know 100 gigabit when you're transferring you know petabytes of data it's it takes a huge amount of time. Yeah, that's the uh, technical term for that, though, who so watch WikiMon uh, and SiliconANGLE, is the CTAM, the Chevy truck access method. That's <laughs> I love it. So, I mean, it, it, it's still, locality is still important, um, but there are some applications, and this is the, the part that we see more and more, the applications are, are being tailored to what the infrastructure can provide. And so in, in environments where you truly have data that's so large, you have to make sure that your application is distributed so that you are not moving the data as much. Yeah. Um, so, 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 Greg, while we've got you here and we're on this topic, we mm -hmm. always talk about, you know, what's, what's the adoption of, of some of these trends? So in the enterprise, we still see at the edge of the server level, it's still a lot of one gig. I think still, you know, definitely over 50% one gig, you know, trending 60, 70% maybe, um, you know, 10 gig and 40 gig starting to come in some of the core. Whereas if I talk about kind of the, you know, the internet's got 100 gig on some of the backbone uh, and the cloud guys have 10 gig pervasive, 40 and 100 gigs starting to come out. What, you know, what, what are you seeing and you know, what do you expect to see over the next year or two mm. there? What's holding us back? Boy, a yeah. lot, lot of interesting trends in, yeah. just in general, but I, I completely concur with you. I mean, we're, we're focused a lot on, on looking at the enterprise rack and tower where the penetration of, of one gig is, you know, unfortunately it's about 90 some odd percent, really only about eight to 10 percent uh, migration or penetration of 10 gig in that classic enterprise rack and tower. Um, we are starting to see signs of that moving though. And you know, if, if we talked about blades, well blades are, are predominantly 10 gig you know, today, uh, 85, 90% 10 gig. Um, but we're really looking at, at the trend of how to get more 10 gig in, in uh, that rack and tower, which is the bulk of the, of the overall enterprise. Um, 10 Base T is starting to make uh, more of, a, of an impact in that market. Um, you know, that market tends to be uh, dominated by, you know, end of row uh, kind of switching. And in, in that kind of environment, you know, just a, a simple low cost uh, copper DAC cable for 10 gig, it, it, it won't reach to the end of, end of row. So 10G base T makes a lot of sense. It does let you uh, upgrade your servers and your switches independently. And now we see from virtually all the switch vendors, uh, you know, 10 gig, uh, 10G base T uh, switches being offered that are pretty competitive and much, much lower power than first, second, and even third generation uh, capabilities. So yeah, and, and how, how's the, how are the cloud guys, you know, affecting this adoption? I mean, I, you see, if you add up, you know, you know, you know, Google and Microsoft and Facebook, you know, it's starting to be, you know, more percentage of the overall ports being shipped. Uh, you know, I, I heard it might even be 20% of uh, overall port shipments today. Um, you know, wh where's their adoption driving things? But I think, in general, the, the whole of the, the cloud or mega data centers, um, what they do is they give the, the enterprise, I think, a vision for where they can go from uh, both the economy uh, of scale standpoint and just looking at applications through a new lens. Uh, the enterprise still moves you know, quite a bit slower. Part of that's because their scale is much, much lower. When you're uh, putting in an entirely new data center, you know, the way Facebook and some of these other folks do, or deploy tens of racks at a time, you know, to uh, deploy an entire application on this new hardware. Uh, the classic enterprise typically doesn't do things like that. They typically replace their hardware at the end of a three-year or five-year lease. And so just the adoption cycles are very different. But having said that, I think what we are seeing is, is we're seeing that the, the costs uh, some of the, the classic OEMs have really reduced their, their pricing strategies on higher speed networking gear and, and mix. And I think that can do nothing but help the adoption rates. Uh, and plus I think as virtualization gets more of a foothold, you know, now it, it's, it's no longer sort of a nice to have technology, it's a mandatory technology and the scale of it keeps getting larger and larger. And 10 gig is a natural, 10 gig and even beyond is required when you put tens of, of physical servers on, on one virtual server platform. So you're watching CUBE Conversations. We're here with Greg Shear of, of Broadcom talking about storage and networking trends. Greg, we were talking about some of the, the trends around convergence and cloud. SDN, hot buzzwords, you know, you hear it when you go to you know, VMworld and, and now all over, all kinds of action going on. 
What's your take on SDN? Does it increase the need, for instance, for specialized appliances? Does it decrease the, the need and we're just going to have commodity components running everywhere? What's your point of view on that? Boy, I mean, SDN is, is certainly all the rage. You, you can't open up a trade rag, uh, excuse me, for those of you that, that publish those. <laughs> Um, but SDN is everywhere in terms of, uh, you know, all of its nomenclature. You know, from Broadcom standpoint, we think SDN is, is wonderful. Um, and I do think that it, it's going to drive commoditization. Broadcom's not afraid of, of commoditization. There's many companies that hear that C word, and it's a four-letter word in their vocabulary. For Broadcom, we're all about volume. So for us, having something that, that moves towards commodity and be, being able to use uh, you know, specialized software, but on commodity kind of appliances, server appliances. We've seen this happen with storage in general, you know, uh, in the whole cloud environment. That's really the basis now for storage within the cloud in mega data centers. It's just commodity servers, very specialized software, so that the software is what gives the, the, the storage its unique value, global file systems, uh, global object spaces, things like that. Um, and, and we see that trend increasing, and SDN is really going to do, uh, you know, for the, the whole of the switching infrastructure. And I think even beyond switching infrastructure, it, it really allows uh, whole applications to be built around this whole concept of building the entire software-defined application in both, you know, looking at the network and all the, the compute uh, components as individual components that can be plugged in as needed at the lowest possible uh, cost points. So talk about applications. One of the new emerging applications is, of course, big data. You guys are doing mm -hmm. some work in, in big data. You have a, a big data lab. Um, uh, talk about that a little bit. You bet. So we're, we're very excited because, you know, Broadcom is traditionally, uh, you know, uh, and I'll say not just Broadcom, but most uh, networking vendors, we've really focused on micro benchmarks. So things like, RFC 2544 to look at what our latency characteristics were or the number of packets per second that we can do at a, at a given uh, network uh, packet size. And those are the things that you'll see published from most folks. What we're really focusing in, on now, especially when we look at, at big data, is building out an ecosystem and then testing in the real world and finding out what, what are the things that we can accelerate when we get closer to that application. Big data being, you know, one of the most important things going on now. But big data is really a conglomeration of there's a compute aspect to big data. There's, uh, you know, a networking aspect in terms of acquiring the data and then uh, sending our results over the network to a, a different home and then extracting the data out of, uh, you know, that those results and, and exporting them maybe to a uh, some other kind of uh, SQL or non uh, no SQL kind of database. So there's multiple aspects, and so what we've done is we've built up a big data lab to go ahead and really simulate those. So running, running that in real world environments with uh, tunable parameters to find out what, what, what made the biggest difference. What difference does latency have on the overall workload? What difference does bandwidth have on the workload? What difference and what are the things that we could do to accelerate those? So in addition to kind of the big data uh, lab, We've also been looking at uh, sort of web 2.0 workloads, uh, memcached, um, looking at ways to accelerate the application. So getting away from kind of the micro benchmarks to look at how fast a given operation can be done, like how fast we can transport a packet from point A to point B, um, versus uh, let's look at it from the application standpoint, look at what the response time is for a particular query. Uh, and, and what we can do to influence that and how many of those per second we can do from an application perspective as opposed to just uh, looking at it from the micro benchmarks. So, so Greg, you know, it, it, it's so interesting to hear you say that because, you know, I, I think back, you know, before, you know, we were, you know, optimizing, as you said, you know, TCP or iSCSI or, you know, some of these things because it was just, you know, it was Microsoft and I had a billion applications that sat on Microsoft and they all had different, you know, requirements. Um, it, it sounds today th th there's a, a few really key applications that are going to be done at such huge scale that you could focus because, you know, if I think back, you know, 10 years ago, there's no way, you know, any company could have said, oh, we're going to optimize for, you know, an application just because there's so many of them. Um, so yes. is, is that, 
you know, is that what you're seeing then? Are we going to have, you know, uh, does Hadoop, you know, own half the world's storage in five years uh, from now? As uh, I think that was, uh, you know, Eric Baldeschweier uh, from, you know, made that quote, uh, you know. So, you know, what, what, where, where do you see applications going in the future? Well, I, I think that's such an important uh, aspect, especially as we look at where the world's going in scale. You know, Hadoop has revolutionized the way we store, you know, data, the, the locality issues of, uh, you know, pushing compute to where the data is where possible. Um, but even down to things like, um, you know, Memcached to where, and if you blur your eyes a little bit, Memcached is nothing more than a distributed application to basically look up billions or trillions of objects through a key pair lookup. Um, so you think, well, if, if we don't call it memcached, but we look at it in, in terms of other applications, what can hardware do to help accelerate those lookups? Because a lot of those lookups are memory-based lookups to where you look up in one table, you hash a key, and then that takes you to a secondary table and a, another table and so forth. Well, hardware can be quite good at some of those operations, hashing specifically, CRC calculations. So that's the level that we're looking at. But to your point, um, it, it's fascinating when you start looking at this from the standpoint of these applications are applications that are derived from, you know, Hadoop, you know, Haystack is a, another application. If you figure out how to accelerate things in Hadoop or things in Memcache, they naturally follow to a whole suite of other capabilities as well. So I think the world is getting more diverse in some respects, but more commonality between the different you know, factions and diversities. So Greg, I, I love when you come on theCUBE because you can talk about a lot of different things. You talk about you know, the host side, you can talk about controllers, switches, storage, uh, networking obviously. Um, tie it all together for us. You, you run strategy for, for server and storage. You mentioned earlier, you, you welcome commodity. For, so from, a, from a strategy standpoint, how are you guys taking the company sort of beyond those you know, traditional uh, uh, components that are becoming more commodity-like and you know, moving into to more of a business value discussion. Oh, you bet, thanks. Because uh, you know, we, we really do see a tremendous amount of change in the data center. And uh, you know, I think 10 years ago, we were almost exclusively fo focused on hardware-based uh, OEMs and hardware-based uh, distribution methods of, of you know, Broadcom capabilities. Now, many of our partners are really software partners. You know, folks that are, are looking at adding value both in SDN and Hadoop, uh, you know, general big data, a lot of the applications themselves, and figuring out how to make it easy for those to, to proliferate through the entire data center. So, you know, having a seat in the host as well as a seat in the network, uh, I think gives us a, a, a very unique position to look at sort of globally looking at the applications and uh, figuring out how to not only accelerate them, but make it easier to deploy. Uh, you know, many of these things become buzzwords in the industry. SDN is kind of the, the current, you know, buzzword in the industry. But I think we're, we're also looking at ways to sort of demystify that and make it more practical. You know, take, uh, uh, you know, some of the, the, you know, mysterious aspects of it. And, you know, through our, our uh, SDK, software development kits, and through software that we work with partners, figure out ways to, to show the value proposition and push that out into the marketplace. Well, Greg, thanks very much for coming on to CUBE Conversations. You've been slash SiliconANGLE. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time.